Welcome back to the Progressive Rehab and Strength Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Alyssa Havison, and I am here with my co-host, Dr. Rory Alter. And today we will be, I will be interviewing Rory uh, on her history of ankle mobility, ankle issues, and how she's dealt with that. So we really want to decrease the fear that people have about ankle mobility and issues, especially while they're squatting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, through sharing your story, Rory, <laughs> um, it rhymes. <laughs> we're, you know, I, our goal here is to hopefully decrease that fear and, and let people know that it's okay to have asymmetries, unilateral ankle mobility, uh, limited ankle mobility on one side and, and, and still barbell train. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about what you, how you discovered that you were having an issue, what you did about it and how you're doing now. Um, but you know, first my personal beliefs about ankle mobility and squatting is it's really that there I think is no issue. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that the ankle and ankle mobility is often blamed for something that isn't isn't related to the ankle and and whether or not there is a deficit in ankle mobility, uh you, you can usually still squat just fine and we really don't need to be stepping away from the barbell to address ankle mobility to then get back under the bar and if there really truly is a deficit an ankle mobility that is affecting someone's ability to squat below parallel, the best thing that they can do is load their body and squat through mm -hmm. the greatest available range of motion that they have to improve <clears throat> their mobility and, you know, and actually use those tissues and load them. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about how like I changed my motor pattern, you know, so we, when we have ankle or when we have any type of limitation, we kind of make compensations or, um, we develop a motor pattern that accommodates that limitation. And so I had to take a very mental approach to changing my ankle mobility. And it wasn't, and that's really what I'm going to talk about today is that it wasn't that I incorporated all these ankle mobility exercises. I literally used the squat and I used my brain um, and my daily movements to fix not fix, address and lengthen the tissues in my ankle <clears throat> in order to gain more range of motion, you know? So like, and you know, our belief here at PRS, and I think a lot of the more progressive physical therapists out there will say that blind ankle mobility exercises that aren't followed up closely with strengthening through the full available range of motion after you've done those mobility exercises aren't going to help you. You know, the only way to change the tissue is to load it. Cause our, if we could change our mobility and our tissue length that easily, we'd be like spaghetti. <laughs> you know, we'd be like stretch Armstrong. <laughs> I'm dating myself here, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, I just wanted to share this story, you know, during the foot and ankle <clears throat> um, month, because like we talked about in the functional anatomy episode, and I think we'll have an, I, I can't remember relative to when this is coming out, but we'll probably either before or after this episode have an, uh, an episode on foot and ankle injuries that they don't happen in training. <laughs> you know, it's very uncommon to experience an injury to the foot or ankle in training, like dropping a weight on your toe. Um, that's a, that's a, common but like that's a weightlifting injury but it's not even common um and then also like tripping over the platform and rolling your ankle or something like that but they're not even directly related to lifting they're just kind of weight room accidents you know um and so the uh, I forget what I'm saying walk where you put your feet and what <laughs> you put on your feet what was my point I forget my point it's not it's not common to have foot and ankle injuries from this sport, but sometimes we might feel like they're affecting our lifting, yeah. Our lifting. Whether or not that is truly what's affecting our lifting is another question. Sometimes mm -hmm. it might be, but you know, how we deal with it, uh you know, we don't necessarily again need to step away from the, the right. bar. But you know, let's talk about you and let's backtrack um <laughs> and, and go back to the beginning so the beginning Rory, when, oh my gosh yeah, the beginning of your <laughs> ankle uh, uh when did you well <laughs> it started with my mom and my dad <laughs> <laughs> and 
and after that, when did you first notice <laughs> right. okay, that you so, had an ankle mobility deficit and was it affecting you in any way at that time? Yeah. So first and foremost, I was a dancer. So I spent a lot of time on my toes, <laughs> pointing my toes in plantar flexion. So dancers typically tend to have more plantar flexion range of motion than they do dorsiflexion range of motion anyway. Um, but I also have, have very flat feet. Um, I have a flexible arch, I would say. So like when I'm, when I'm in non weight bearing, I do have an arch. Um, but when I'm weight bearing that arch flattens out. So people who have flat feet tend to have more foot issues than someone who has a new, a typical foot. And then people with high arches, um, also tend to have issues, but they're different types of issues. Um, so I always had arch pain on my left foot. Um, so I maybe avoided that foot a little bit more, I don't know, throughout my whole life. So there could be some uneven weight bearing going on in my, throughout my whole life. Right. Um, but then in college I got into endurance sports, specifically triathlons, which is swim, bike and run. Um, and there's a lot of ankle mobility required in swimming. It's a quick plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, range of motion through the water. Um, you're in plantar flexion when you're cycling and then you get off the bike and you go right into running. Um, and then, you know, you're training these things also. And my body's just not built to run. Um, but there are some people who are natural born runners and I am not one of them. Um, but I enjoyed the sport itself. I enjoyed the, um, short distance running. Um, and I was good at swimming and I was good at biking. So like, I just threw, I should have done duathlons instead of triathlons, but whatever. <laughs> um, but despite not being good at running, I still ran a lot. Um, and in college I started to develop medial ankle pain, um, behind the medial malleolus. <clears throat> and, it's, I started to get this pocket of swelling just under the, the malleolus um, and it really was bothering me. And so I went to the doctor and got this diagnosis of posterior tibial tenocytovitis or nowadays they call it tendinopathy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in back then it was like tendinitis, tendinosis, tenocytovitis, like whatever they called it um, back then I had that supposedly and you know I did the typical physical therapy thing um, balance heat ultrasound like all that bs that we do not do here at PRS um, <laughs> and it's funny because I was going into PT school and I was like oh I love learning this like this is amazing it's like cool to experience this you know, as a student, um, but, and I didn't know better back then, you know, so I would go and I would do like the BOSU balancing stuff and like the menu, the, like I, soft tissue massage. When I was in PT, in PT before, uh -huh. like right before PT school, uh -huh. I had a different attitude. I was well, I like, know. don't waste my money on yeah. this. Yeah, like <laughs> I know. Well, it wasn't my money. It was my dad's money. <laughs> I don't even remember paying like one copay because I was, I think they just like billed my dad. This was all while I was in college. I was a little older at that point. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I just showed up, I did the thing, you know, and they put me in orthotics and I just like, wasn't getting better. They didn't coach me or educate me on pulling back on running. And, you know, I don't remember, um, any of load, no discussion on load, ma load management at all. Um, it was just like, let's do this. Maybe they said, don't run. I can't remember. They said, let's do this, this physical therapy, which is like passive modalities and balancing stuff. And, um, we'll get you into orthotics. I was like, okay. Like I didn't know better. And honestly, the orthotics were awful. I got blisters from them on my medial arch because I'm such a pronator that like, there was nothing that I could do to run in those without getting blisters, you know? Um, I hated them, so I stopped wearing them. Um, and then I still was having issues. So I remember going and they gave me, because I was still having issues, they gave me a cortisone injection. I think I had two. And I was put in a walking boot. I remember it was my senior year. I was put in a walking boot. And I actually got out of, 
<laughs> I was able to p- get an extension on a final <laughs> because there was a snowstorm and I emailed the professor and I was like, listen, I'm in a cast and I can't <laughs> to the final in the snowstorm so can I come and take it when there's no snow he's like yeah sure no problem so I got like two more days to study for my economics final um yep that that was your reduced ankle mobility yeah right (laughs) so um well I didn't have a reduced ankle mobility at that point yeah if I recall correctly you know but it's all these things that kind of lead up to an ankle range of motion deficit Mm -hmm. um so I was in the boot and, and I had the shots. And then also at night, they put me in a night splint that held me in one position, um, which just knowing what I know now is like is not, so not <laughs> what I would have ever done for any of my patients. Um, so <clears throat> as you can, you know, we talked about this in the functional anatomy episode that when you immobilize that immobile like our bodies are meant to move they're not meant to be immobile so when we immobilize things it it uh basically that there's like disuse and you get adaptive shortening um or adaptive positioning of the tissues and you also get um weakening of the muscles in that area because they're not moving through the range of motion that that they need to, to maintain their strength or to get their full strength. So even if I was, you know, in like, I was walking, but you get so much strengthening or maintenance of your strength through just walking, you know, that when you don't walk on it, you lose strength. That's why when people come out of a cast or a boot, they, they're like shriveled up, you Mm -hmm. know, and their range of motion is, is, decrease so much because they have not used it and it's tight and it's uncomfortable and it's stiff and all that kind of stuff. So I was going through this like immobilization, remobilization every single day. And I was in, you know, if if you think about it, I was in a boot, what, for eight hours while, or even after I came out of the boot, I was still in that night splint, you know, and we, we get a lot of range. Um, I have, it's funny because I have, I'm trying to think, let me look at my feet for a second. Yeah, I actually have more dorsiflexion and plantar flexion on my left foot, and I have much less plantar flexion and dorsiflexion on my left foot. And, you know, you sleep, mostly sleep in plantar flexion. You know, if you're like lying on your belly, your foot falls into plantar flexion. If you're lying on your back, you've got your blankets that kind of push your feet into plantar flexion just a little bit. And I wasn't getting that for months, you know, and I lost a significant range. Um, but didn't know like there was and here's the thing I was no longer dancing and I so I didn't need that plantar flexion range of motion and I came out of the boot and I was able to go up and down stairs I was able to walk and I was able to run with the range that I had so there was no need for me to gain that range of motion back like I was able to do everything that I needed to do so I had functional range of motion Mm -hmm. which is fine like you know when we're looking at the traditional person you know who isn't an athlete um that's great (laughs) you know it's not you know you don't always necessarily get full equal range of motion um uh, after injuries like that or not even like that mine was it was the most stupid injury I'm talking about injuries like a fracture to the ankle or like a knee replacement or something like that. This was an insignificant range of motion uh, injury, not insignificant, but I just feel like it was treated like this massive injury that it shouldn't have been treated like, you know, but what did we know back then? You know, things were different 10. Oh my gosh. How many years ago was that? Uh, 16 years ago. (laughs) 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 So, so anyway, um, the, I can, I started running after that again, and I don't really remember the whole process and like how it felt after that, but I never did longer distances than sprint triathlons. I did like an Olympic once, but my running distance was a 5k. Like there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it because that, like, I just couldn't tolerate any more running than that. Um, so fast forward to, I'm trying to think. 
Yeah, fast forward to PT school and I switched into like everyone was always trying to put me in like running shoes for pronators and like flat people who have flat feet and all this stuff. And I never, ever once found a sneaker that was comfortable for me until I was like, you know what? F it. I see everybody in these like toe shoes, right? And there's something to this barefoot running, but I've got to find something that is not as hideous as toe shoes because I did not like the so you didn't wear the toe shoes I did not wear the toe shoes okay I promise you don't worry <laughs> <laughs> um so I the Nike free run had just come out and and it was relatively new um when we were in when I was in PT school in like 2009 to 2012 I'd have to look it up you know, don't quote me on that, but I feel like it was relatively new on the market. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try this shoe. And for the first time in my entire life, my feet, my knees, and my hips did not hurt all the time when I was standing. And I was like, this is game changing. Oh, also I I found Crocs (laughs) and, um, my my feet, my knees, and my hips did not hurt when I was standing in Crocs and when I was um, wearing uh, the Nike Free Run. Like I just during... can't picture you wearing Crocs. Oh, I wore Crocs. I mean, I wear Crocs. Like, well, I wear them. In, I wore the them when like when I was in the clinic, you know, um, <laughs> in the hospital. Like I think I got them for my first acute care rotation um, because. I can't remember why. I just like everybody work. I didn't want to wear the dance go clogs like those. Like did not with the appear. holes in the front crocs, like they yes. let you wear them in the hospital with like yeah. open. No, not open toe. Like they had the holes. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. surprised. Yeah, I don't know. What if you dropped the needle on the hole? Well, we're PTs. We're well, not. What if somebody needles. else dropped the needle? <laughs> we're not in those scenarios. <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, um, uh, I for the, you're cracking up at yourself. <laughs> For the first fi- first time in my entire life, I like really didn't have foot pain on bo- in both feet. So that arch pain that I always experienced in my left foot and then the tarsal tunnel syndrome, which I, I diagnosed it as tarsal tunnel syndrome after like uh, getting educated. Um, so um, I basically survived. I've been wearing the Nike free run ever since really. And that has been like a huge thing for my foot giving my foot the freedom to like move in its full range of motion in terms of all the joints in the foot, not constraining the foot. And like, that's how even I have four bunions. I don't have like the bunions that like over, like push your toes and like my toes are actually straight. I just have like giant bunion bones. (laughs) I have a Taylor bunion and the typical great toe bunion. Um, But we develop those because our feet are like constrained and squished into things. Um, And so for the first time in my life, my feet were feeling fabulous. Um, And I wore them to run. And I was able to like, I mean, I ran for I ran really all through PT school. um, But I stopped running when I I actually ran a lot as conditioning. when I first got into competitive powerlifting because I was like trying to maintain a lower weight class. Um, And I didn't have issues with like short distance running and wearing the Nike free. So basically I am still in those shoes. Um, And then they even came out with the fly knit material, um, which is this very, very soft um, woven flexible fabric that they, that Nike uses. And once I switched to that for the first time in my entire life, my bunions didn't hurt. Like I would be in a shoe for a prolonged period of time and my bunions would start burning because they were like rubbing into the shoe or there was just too much pressure on them. Um, So I'm a diehard Nike free fly knit person and just I don't care what Nike does. Like it's the only shoe that has ever felt like extremely comfortable. I wore the New Balance. New Balance has like a flat free type barefoot shoe that I wore for a while. I can't remember what it is, but the material for the actual shoe was not um, as I didn't like it as much as the the fly knit, so I went back to the Nike fly knit. Um, I was gonna say we're not, this is not an advertisement for, for no, Nike. It's, you know my my general feeling about shoes is that what works best for someone is, is not going to be the same as the next person. Exactly, and it's really about and it's the same thing as you know 
mattresses and people mm-hmm. ask me what mattress they mm-hmm. should get I'm like whichever or one like has pillows. the longest pillows trial are... period yeah <laughs> you know so that you can like maybe get sore and then adjust right, and then right. see how you're doing yeah. and you know so shoes really there isn't one right fit there isn't one right mm-hmm. shoe we all have different feet we all have different needs and it's about finding what's right for you so even though that you know the Nikes might work beautifully for you Rory they could be horrible for me it really I don't yeah I know it one, absolutely but. and I think you know I let me tell you I just had a garage sale and I sold probably like five or six pairs of unworn or worn once shoes that still had the box because shoes are a very difficult thing for a person who has foot problems to buy. Um, and I'm telling you, I am the person who buys all the shoes and then like wears them once or twice and is like, I'm going to die. These hurt so bad, you know? And so you I wear them around your house and then return them. It doesn't matter. I, I ne- well, return them. <laughs> well, <laughs> not, no, I'm bad at that. Um, but anyway, sometimes you just can't, I don't know. Okay. So, you're right. <laughs> yeah. There's not a good, I'm sorry. I know, bad okay. to that. <laughs> anyway, um, I sold them all for $15. So I made a lot of money off my shoes. <laughs> you would have had more money if you returned. I know, I know, I know, I know. So you started lifting in, in PT school yep. and you, it sounds like at that point you had things under control with your shoes mm-hmm. and your, your feet and your mm-hmm. ankle. But so when you started to lift and started to squat, did you have any issues with your depth? Did you? No. And, and, and so then nope. why not? Why didn't yeah. you at that point? Well, um, well, I didn't because ankle mobility doesn't. If you squat, if you have a good coach, your feet and your legs are in the right position and you have good body awareness and you actually use your brain um, to overcome the limitations of your body, you have the mobility to squat. And we talked about this in the functional anatomy uh, episode like Alyssa and I asked John this and I've I've said this many times publicly before in the absence of someone having like had a fracture with a surgery with like pins and needles literally put into their ankle um or a neurological dysfunction that affects muscular tone or I'm trying to think what else like that's it that would be why someone might not achieve depth it is not your ankle like the amount of ankle mobility issues that someone might have who's never had a massive trauma or injury to the foot is not enough to affect squatting um so i never had a shift i never had a depth problem in fact i i went too low um and i went too forward in my squats and the more forward you go in your squats that requires more ankle mobility. Um, And I ended up with hip issues because of my knee slide. And you wouldn't have that much knee slide if, if ankle mobility was affecting it. Um, So even though I had this asymmetric mobility in my ankles, it was not affecting my squat asymmetrically and it was not affecting my depth. So I never like did anything about it. Um, until I'm trying to think when it became an issue. Oh, so I probably started to notice that for physical therapists out there, you know, like sometimes, yeah, we want to use like the, a squat. Like if we're assessing someone's squat, we're going to put them in their squat stance, right? But if we're assessing someone just, you know, in the clinic, we sometimes ask them to squat with their heels under their hips, their toes forward knees forward just to kind of get a sense of how they follow instruction how they can balance and you can look at ankle that's a really good place to look at ankle mobility because you need a lot of and this is why we say it's not that your ankle mobility is affecting your squats you're not squatting right (laughs) um but when your knees are forward when your toes are forward you're going to need more ankle mobility because your knees have to go more forward in order for you to achieve depth um so we can look at someone someone's mobility in the clinic in standing that way through a squat um and whenever I demonstrated it even if I was demonstrating like I noticed one day I was demonstrating like not even a full depth squat in that position and my heel came up 
I don't remember when this was. I don't remember how long ago it was. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Why is my heel coming up? <laughs> this isn't what I want them to do. Mm. <laughs> like, and it was significant. Like, it was blocking me. Like, it was shockingly odd to me that my ankle was coming up so quickly on that. And I was like, what the frick is going on? And <laughs> if I tried to do a full depth squat in that position, I would – lose my balance backwards because I didn't have that enough ankle range of motion for that. Um, But it still wasn't a problem. It was only a problem mentally because I kept saying to my husband, like, what the heck is wrong with my ankle? Like, why don't I have this ankle mobility? This really bothers me mentally, not physically. You know, like I could go up and down the stairs. I could walk. I could run if I had to run away from a demon or something. Um, But a demon, I don't know why I said demon. Probably not going to be the I'm first still thing dating myself about. because that's like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There were like demons in every episode. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, like I didn't do anything about it until this. I don't know. I, I even squatted in flats for a really long time because heel like uh, the traditional weightlifting shoe I had squatted in for a while. And then my knees got pretty achy. So I switched to flats and I liked flats better. Um, and then. I don't know. It must have been after I had my son that I put weightlifting shoes back on because of I couldn't like I was having trouble with my back on the bench press. Um, I couldn't get good leg drive because my body just wasn't comfortable arching that much. So I basically used the weightlifting shoe in my bench press to lift my legs up a little bit, so to speak. Um, and that gave me better leg drive. I loved it. And then I was like, you know what? I, I have just like, I don't want to switch shoes <laughs> mid-training session. So I was like, I'm just going to wear my um, my weightlifting shoes because I also noticed that my right hip started – like I was getting a little pinch in my right hip before I did that. Um, so this is all after I had my son. I was getting a little pinch in my right hip, and I kept saying like, John, this is my good hip. Like why is it pinching here? You know, like why am I pinching? This is not normal. This didn't happen before, J.D., Um, But then I noticed when I wore my lifters, I wasn't getting that pinch. So I was like, oh, that's kind of cluing me into maybe, maybe my ankle range of motion is having, having an effect on my hip. Um, But I can wear weightlifting shoes because it doesn't matter like that. I can wear that. Like that's a quick fix. You know, people like people wear them, you know, it's a, this is the sport shoe. So it's not a problem. You know, I I still have the range of motion and I'm not having pain now that I have the shoe on. So my ankle never hurt. My heel ankle never hurt. So then, um, I went through like a training mental, like midlife crisis last summer. Um, and I was sick for a, a, a long time. I was sick for like six weeks last summer and I just didn't want to barbell train. I just like, I worked at home. I'd been home for, you know, during the pandemic and a new mom and like always home. And I just, I was like, I got to get out of here. So I started running again. <laughs> I think I remember you asking me if I wanted to train for like a 5K. A 5K, yeah. And I was yeah. like, no. No, no, thank you. Absolutely <laughs> I was like, I'm not. sorry. I don't think it's a good idea for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I just needed to get the fuck out of my house. And I just like had these like this like every day I woke up and I was like, I just want to (laughs) run. I just want to run. Like I just needed to run. I I don't know. Like it was this like burning inside of me that I just wanted to get the fuck out of my house and run. Um, because the, I guess it was like the pandemic and work and baby and like, just, I felt very like claustrophobic in my house. And so I didn't want to train because I didn't want to be in my house, you know? Um, cause my, train my gym is here and so I basically I was like I'm just gonna go run and I had a pair of Nike freeze that I had bought you know like I just buy them because they change their um basically like every couple years every company shoe company changes their like design why I'm laughing because I literally just bought a pair of my squat shoes today (laughs) that the Addy Power twos because yeah. they're the same height as the Addy Power ones, and I found like one pair in my size, and the Addy Power threes are higher. So I was oh, like, oh, yeah. I might as well just get them. All. Exactly, like my, they change. Falling apart. Yeah. I don't so want my mom always says, if you find a shoe you like, buy five of them. 
<laughs> because like, and it's true. So I had a pair of Nike Freeze that were relatively new, like they hadn't been worn a lot. And you know, you want to be careful with like how many mile, how much mileage is on your shoes. So I wore my newest Nikes, even though they weren't like brand new, um, to run. And I, I did okay. I mean, I did like a gradual like run walk progression for a couple of weeks. I would say I was running like twice a week. So maybe this was going on for like three or four weeks. And in the fourth week, I started to get lateral foot pain, um, a sharp lateral foot pain. And I was like, oh, dear. And even though I have all this education and I'm a licensed physical therapist and I have a doctor in front of my name, you don't think that like anything applies to you. So I was like, I'll just keep running and this will stop eventually. (laughs) (laughs) We're our worst patients. I know. And I did that with front squats um, for a while, like years ago. I was, I have a torn cartilage behind my kneecap and it's been there for years. And um, I was like, front squats were hurting and I was, but I programmed them for myself and I was like, I'm just going to keep squatting because like, if I just squat, maybe I'll just will like totally tear and and, like knock it out and I'll be fine. Right. No, don't take that advice guys. That is not what you should do. Um, But anyway, I kept running through it. Um, I was like, I just need to keep running. Like maybe this is just me getting used to it or whatever idiot I know (laughs) and then we went on I got sick I was dealing with um, some upper respiratory issue for a really long time and we went on vacation and you know you're wearing like your fancy flat like open toe shoes so they're like a hard thin bottom and it's like not normal mechanics and um, it was very hilly in Lake George and um, I what did I do? Oh, I went into the the hotel gym and I ran on the treadmill and that was like the end of my foot. I couldn't, I couldn't walk. I mean, I could walk, but I was like, I had to hide my limp from the rest of the family because the, the Patrizzo family was with us and I didn't, I was coughing up a storm and you have to be like, I took five COVID tests before I came on vacation. I promise it's not COVID. And then, so I'm like death, deathly ill. Um, which probably contributed to the issue as well. Um, And then I'm like limping. uh, And I'm pretty sure I ended up with a stress fracture. Never went to the doctor because like, what is the doctor going to do? Tell me like not to run. Okay. (laughs) Obviously I can't run if I have a stress fracture. Is there any reason why you don't think it was like a tendonitis? Oh yeah. It was because it was. Because the last time I thought I had a stress fracture in my foot, I didn't. It was, I couldn't walk. I was crawling to walk my dog. It was just. Um, (laughs) because of how localized it was, um, and where it was on my foot, it was like the base of the fifth metatarsal. Um, and when you look, so this is the PT coming into me and I'm like, okay, obviously I have enough range of motion to squat, but I clearly have different mechanics between both my feet because I have much more range of motion in plantar flexion and dorsiflexion on my left foot. That foot never hurt me, was not hurting me at all when I was running. And there had to be something in terms of how I was landing. So basically, I was not pronating enough on my right foot because the dorsiflexion range of motion was so limited. Um, if that's no, the because pronation range of motion was limited, and then I was not getting good enough push off. I don't know. Like I just, my foot wasn't supinating enough and it wasn't pronating pronating enough because of how limited my ankle range of motion was relative to my left foot. Um, so because of that, the lateral aspect of my foot was taking more load than the medial aspect was. And so I said to myself, it's time to do something about this because if I want to run again, without having pain because this was pain I never experienced when I was running previously um I was like I need to address this so I embarked on a journey to address my ankle range of motion limitation because of running not because of squatting and how did you address your ankle mobility limitation Rory with squatting (laughs) Which is so interesting because I, I can't tell you how many times we've seen or we've heard people say like, you know, I can't squat until I can 
fix my ankle mobility and like the ankle mobility is fine but for some mm-hmm. reason somebody told them they shouldn't be squatting because mm-hmm. of their ankle and you're mm-hmm. using squatting to fix your ankle yeah. mobility it's an yeah. issue with something else mm-hmm. yeah so I noticed I started to pay attention to some of my adaptive movements um that my compensations basically so because or adaptive movements. so basically um I said, okay, well, obviously like months back or like a year back or whatever, I put my weightlifting shoes on and I said, and I said, oh, that's funny. I noticed less hip pain. And so I thought back to that scenario and I thought maybe the pinching in my right hip was because I was trying to get that motion of the knee forward from somewhere else up the chain because I didn't have it in my ankle. So when you look at me squatting or when you looked at me squatting in my normal squat stance, barefoot, without addressing the issue, without like mentally addressing the issue, which I'll, or t- I'll talk about, and without having done any intervention for the ankle, my heel would come up. So my heel would come up to move the knee forward more so that I could achieve depth. And that was causing some, and if I, I guess if I didn't do that, that was causing some type of pinching in the front of the hip. Um, So the band-aid was to artificially raise the heel with the weightlifting shoe, which further decreased the range of motion that I was strengthening my tissues through, right? Because now I'm not even going all the way down on my heel, you know, to where it was lifting. I'm just I've lifted my heel up. So it's mm-hmm. not, it's like a non-issue. Um, so I took my, my weightlifting shoes off and I said, you know what? I'm going to squat barefoot. <laughs> like I'm going to squat barefoot. I'm going to start light and I'm going to really focus on the position of my knees and the position of my heels when I'm squatting. And I used the squat to stretch out, lengthen and, sh- and strengthen the tissues in my ankle. And when I'm telling you, I could not even do a supported single leg squat, like pistol squat. I couldn't do a supported single leg pistol. Well, pistol squat is a single leg squat. Um, I couldn't do that uh, when I first embarked on this journey um, because I didn't have the range of motion, which I used to, you know, it just like I lost it over time. Um, And I could not do that like squat test, that clinical squat test that I told you about before I couldn't do that and now I can and I actually now I can do that no problem I can squat down I can demonstrate it my heel still comes up a little bit um but it's not as significant and it's not impeding my range of motion the other thing that I I always film my um my bench press from the left side um so I actually and this is something I haven't looked at so I don't know if if that was an issue because I I also used to bench in flats so I have no idea if my um, heel used to come up. I mean, I never got called for it in competition, but I'm curious. You know, obviously this ankle mobility issue got worse over time and I wasn't competing after I had my kid. So I have no idea if it was affecting that more in, in the later years. <clears throat> um, but I have experienced um, – I experienced that stress. And now this is, you know, I have sometimes have moments of clarity um, and I think I'm having a a moment here. Uh, Perhaps my stress fracture in my right hip was related to my ankle issue because I've had knee pain when benching. um, And I'm, I'm wondering if, if I, if my leg drive was affected because of the ankle mobility and I used to bench in flats, you Mm -hmm. know, so, could that be? Why? I don't know. That's my realization right now. Never thought about it that way. Um, but I think it's, it's all, it's all always connected. It's all it's always connected. Of, you know, but, the one thing is that we know we can't like pinpoint one single thing, but maybe if we took one thing out of the equation then stuff wouldn't happen, you know? Right, but. right. Exactly. <laughs> but there was no reason in the past to address it because I wasn't having pain. I wasn't having difficulty with any of my lifts. You know, there were no, the the only warning sign that I had for that hip fracture was that I was having that achiness in my hip before leading into the competition, which was the same kind of pinching that I was feeling that led me to 
want to squat in my weightlifting shoes after I had my child. So maybe, I don't know. Um, anyway, so basically I just have been squatting barefoot, um, since last summer. And additionally, I, I haven't incorporated any other exercises. I was like, oh, let me try some of these mobility exercises that I see on Instagram that I see other physical therapists like raving about. And like, this is the quoted, you know, the, the one where you like put a, a bar, a dumbbell on your knee and you like lunge forward. No, that is not loading your knee. I mean, your ankle, let's be real. Like a 20 pound dumbbell, like your body weighs more than 20 pounds. How is a forward lunge in with a dumbbell on your knee going to really load your ankle? I don't know. Uh, so I tried that one time or two times and I nixed it. Um, and then I just, squat. I've been squatting for a year. The other thing that I do is, you know how we like run up and down stairs and we do it on our toes a lot of the times, like we don't put our whole foot flat. Um, for a very long time, I made a conscious effort to put my foot, my heel down when I was going up the stairs to use every step of my day to improve my ankle mobility. And that's a conscious thing that you have to do. And when I was squatting, I focused very intently on every single rep for many, many weeks on keeping my heel down. And I never put my shoes back on because I wanted to have a visual um not that I was looking at my heels, but if like John was training with me, he would be able to see that like, oh, your heel is coming up. Um, and you have better proprioception. Um, I was totally unaware that my heel was coming up when I had a flat shoe on. Totally unaware of it. Mm -hmm. um, so you have better proprioception when you don't have the shoe on and you can like feel what's happening to your foot rather than like the shoe coming off the ground. Um, and I literally just use my brain to override old motor patterns. Um, and load it at the same time. And I I still have range of motion deficits in the foot, um, but my squat doesn't bother me. I actually, it's funny because I ended up wearing, um, I started benching before squatting recently. So I had my shoes on, my flats on, and then I would squat. And I actually don't like it. I like squatting barefoot. It It's like, it's funny because I actually have more depth it's odd. I have greater depth. I actually have difficulty controlling not going so low now that I've worked on my range of motion in my ankle. But I always had the range of motion to squat to depth. Now it's just a problem of going too low because I've been trying to like stretch out my <laughs> my ankle. Um, so that's now a motor pattern that I have to override. But yeah, like I can so do that stupid squat analysis, like clinical squat analysis and not oh, yeah. fall over these days. The other thing that I also do was like when I'm training my clients and I'm like watching them, um, I'll get into a deep squat position with a very narrow stance and my toes more forward and like just make sure that I can like balance there. Um, so I use like it's functional stretching, if that makes sense. <laughs> when I was working in person, like that's I would literally sit in that position all day long. Like I was always <laughs> down there. <laughs> Maybe that's why my knees have been hurting like the last couple of weeks. <sighs> um, so, all right. When people have ankle range of motion deficits, what is the normal thing that that they do or that PTs prescribe? Like, what does that look like? You know, we've sort of talked about, you know, we don't necessarily need to come out from under the bar and address things, but like what, what does that treatment usually look like? Oh, it's like calf stretching and dorsiflexion stretches and plantar flexion stretches and um, all different types of stretches and then like single leg exercises and proprioception exercises and um, just too many things that don't translate to being under load. And like you cannot load any of those enough like if you want to squat 405 pounds and you have a true ankle range of motion deficit, like the amount of load that you're going to use to do physical therapy type exercises is, let me do math. Maybe you're going to use like 20 pounds, 50 pounds, right? Let's see. Oh, where's my calculator? 
this is like 12% of your squat. <laughs> like, let's be real. You know, the other thing I, I think that happens is, you know, people get these exercises or single leg exercises, think which I think, forever. well, yeah, that's, that's one issue. It's like, <laughs> then, you know, for the rest of their life, they're spending an hour every day doing the <laughs> PT exercises and what's going on. But I do think that sometimes those single leg exercises can have value mm-hmm. in learning about and understanding your feet, especially. Absolutely. I really think there's so much because, you know, as somebody who has collapsed out arches, who doesn't like the way <laughs> her feet feel naturally on the mm-hmm. ground. So mm-hmm. I do control my arch. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah. I stand. Um, I like soup when I'm standing, I like supinate my feet. Like, as yeah, much as I I'm can. just like, this doesn't feel right. But yeah. there were the feet I've walked on my entire life, but I'm just like, why do I feel so yeah. <laughs> laid out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening here? <laughs> um, but I think that those exercises can have value when they really emphasize teaching someone about their foot and their ankle and how to use it and where they where they feel natural and where they need to be mm-hmm. and understanding their movement. And I don't necessarily think that those exercises always come along with that type of instruction either. Right, right. So Well, you know, uh, when Bree and I did our floor and pelvic floor our (laughs) modeling i know (laughs) our core and pelvic floor uh, month we talked about the kegel you know and really those exercises are more for education and body awareness and understanding movement better and learning more about deficits and where you need to work um more than an actual strengthening exercise And, you know, listen, I said that I didn't do anything other than squat and stairs and like use my brain. But I for I think for the first like one or two weeks, I incorporated single leg exercises into it. Um, very minimal, but just to like bring more awareness to the area for my because when you're not like when you don't focus on it, you're you you fall into these maladaptive behaviors, which is how I got into this movement pattern problem anyway, you know? So that's why we use things like the Kegel or like proprioceptive exercises to just bring awareness to the area. And, and I said this in the Kegel episode, I believe like things don't shut off. And I use this, this phrase very loosely, but just to wake the area up, especially because like, if you have a maladaptive movement pattern, then you haven't been using those muscles in the best way possible. So when we force the the area to you to to recruit all the muscles because we're putting it in single leg stance or because we're doing like a, a, an isolated exercise, it just brings more awareness to that area and to that muscle so that you can recruit it better when you're focusing on it. Especially when you have like an asymmetry and mm-hmm. one one ankle or one foot is going to feel yeah. completely different than the other. But those exercises aren't the things that are going to change or strengthen, but they are a good educational tool mm-hmm. and awareness mm-hmm. tool. You know, I yeah. feel fine until I start to do a single leg RDL if I choose to do so. And then well, I'm, <laughs> why am I... <laughs> why is my arch just <laughs> well so that i mean that's a really that's good where, point that's, that's a really a good, good point though like when you give someone a single like exercise they're like oh my god i'm so bad at this i must have this must be a weakness i must have to do this no it's that you're not aware of it and you're not like your body's not conditioned to do it and basically like in like two or three sessions or two or three sets like you're going to be balancing just fine you know and then and then it's it that's like that's the change that you can make and then that has a load ceiling you know these things have load ceilings so as you know we want to go to the heaviest thing that we can do that allows us to maintain the form or the the uh, the appropriate movement pattern that we're trying to to achieve right so like if you've achieved like good movement with your single leg exercise move on to the next level um so yeah like you should not be doing those things forever and for me it was like one to two sessions of incorporating a mobility exercise just to like increase awareness and joint sensations 
um, so that I was like just more focused on it when I was working on my squat. Yeah, I agree with you. I think a lot of people do feel like, okay, they're not good at it, so they need to do it. And it's like, well, you're not, it's not that you're not good at it because you're weak. It's because you are not co- done it. You're not coordinating <laughs> what's you happening here. You haven't practiced it. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't do it. <laughs> but you don't have to be good at everything you don't do. That's it. You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but why do you need to, like, when do we stand on one leg for extended periods of time? We're not pelicans or Yeah, flamingos. but it does give you an flamingos, opportunity to sort of feel. The, that's the... <laughs> We're not, not pelicans, pelicans either. Yeah. <laughs> flamingo. That's the one. The pink you know, one. It gives you an opportunity on to feel leg. what's going on with your body. And mm-hmm. that's where I think there is, you know, uh, you know, the education piece so that we can use our brain and our patients can use their brains to control what's going mm-hmm. on with their body. Mm-hmm. You know, it, sometimes we just if you just give somebody exercise without telling them what to focus on or what's going on, is it really changing anything? Mm -hmm. If they're just poorly doing a single leg exercise every time they come in. Or if they're just poorly doing the squat, yeah, you know, like, and you haven't coached them how to squat to depth and you just blame it on their, I mean, I think that's like a whole other like Mm -hmm. coaches that don't know. I mean, no offense to anybody out there, but like, if you don't know how to coach the squat well, you might feel that someone's ankle mobility is the problem, but really you're the problem. You are not coaching it well, you know? And so as a coach, as a physical therapist, as a movement specialist, you have to figure out how to communicate movement to your client better. It is not Again, like 99% of people do not have an ankle range of motion limitation that should affect them squatting to depth. So either they're not strong enough because they're old or they're tiny and weak or, or you know, they've been injured. So they, they have disuse of, of their limb. You know, they just came out of like they had an, a meniscus surgery or they were in the hospital for a couple of weeks or whatever. It's like strength. Uh, the coach is not communicating well, they're not strong enough, or the person is a motor moron. No offense to anybody who's a motor moron, but like sometimes people just don't move well, you know, and those, and then as the coach, you have the responsibility to change the program and your approach to teaching them and, and progressing them, not work on their ankle mobility. (laughs) I agree. (laughs) So, um, yeah, was there anything else that we wanted to cover here? I think that we covered everything. Oh, the so one question is, did I ever go back to running and how does my foot feel running? <laughs> I asked my own question. <laughs> I have not gone back to running and I'll tell you why. Because I don't have freaking time. <laughs> so um, it's, not that, um, it's not that my ankle and my foot hurts anymore. It's that I literally have not had the time um, to even get my own barbell training in consistently. So running is a lower priority for me than barbell training is. So, um, I do like running. I have found shorts that prevent the thigh chafe, which is a very important thing. Um, if you, if you know what I'm talking about, (laughs) um, so yeah, I mean, I do hope to get back to running and I hope that, you know, this has helped, Um, But ultimately, it is not a function of not wanting to run and not feeling good running. It's just literally a function of time. Um, You know, we we started the podcast last summer. We've had a lot of – we've ran our courses twice um, over this year. So our courses take a lot of time. I have a a two-and-a-half-year-old who stays up a lot later than he used to. (laughs) Uh, and just every time he experiences a new toy or a new thing like last night it was pouring rain and we went out and played did I send you pictures Alyssa I'm gonna have to send you oh my god it's great uh we put our rain boots on and our rain jackets on and we ran through the puddles and under the rain that it was like pouring you just have um, to get him running with you oh uh, yeah well he did come running with me last summer and he took quite a, quite a few naps in the running stroller i mean that could have <laughs> yeah that, um but um if you take him with you now it could help you like you know really reel back your speed <laughs> well it <laughs> does honestly like if i ran with him i would run like two and a half minutes slower um and when i ran without him obviously i ran faster so um 
he was a good running partner. He was so cute. I loved having him with me. Uh, but he's too old to, to do that now. I think he would not want to go on a run with me. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. Um, but I forget what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Just our podcast. And we, we hired some more staff to help us. We now have an executive assistant who is taking a lot of good things off my plate so that I can spend more time with my family and do more of the good things in the business. So hopefully at some point I can get my shit together and start running again. Um, but then it's going to be winter and I'm not going to want to run. And so who knows, <laughs> who knows when, but my foot feels, but good. you'll be ready when I'll be ready when that time comes. Exactly. You've done some work. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, it's been good. So, so I, up. you know, I think, <laughs> You know, probably a few things to touch on before we end this episode. You know, we're all asymmetrical and you've talked about how, you know, the issue that we're that we're talking about here is an asymmetry. Mm -hmm. it, it's not just that both of your ankles are, are limited to some right. degree. It's an asymmetry. And we see other things happen from that asymmetry. But we don't usually need to address these things. And if there is somebody out there who's thinking, oh, I don't know, I think that maybe my ankle is, you know, maybe I do have an asymmetry or, or, or somewhere else in your body. Yeah, like a leg length is usually a big one people ask us about. Correct. Um, that doesn't, just because it's there does not mean that you need to fix it. You've been moving throughout your whole life, most likely like that. And if you don't have any symptoms, and that's just how you move, then it's usually okay. We might want to minimize those asymmetries to, to reduce the chances of anything potentially coming from them and, and you know strengthen more symmetrically, but they may not be perfect. There are some people that that I know are you know asymmetric and they're never going to be completely perfectly symmetrical. And I use the word perfect as in the thing that doesn't exist because <laughs> none of us none of us are symmetrical. I'm not symmetrical. Um, I always say that I have this isn't. saying I have this saying that if someone tells you in like any realm nutrition training work school that they're perfect they are lying to themselves yeah, so, <laughs> and to you to me what perfect is is like what we might see in the textbook of right. the definition mm -hmm. of this is what we want mm -hmm. and sometimes even when I'm giving people technique feedback I'll say ideally this is what mm -hmm. we want to see mm -hmm. <laughs> This is mm -hmm. what we're striving for. We're probably not going to see that every time. Right. Um, but like perfect is like, you know, the, the, if somebody was completely symmetrical, like mm -hmm. that's, it's a thing that doesn't exist. Nope. does not. <laughs> so, and we're all asymmetrical. You know, I, mm -hmm. I am asymmetrical all over. My movement is asymmetrical. I'm never, mm -hmm. my, my, when I squat, my bar is probably never going to be completely yeah. Mine's level. Mine's tilted. I can't remember which way it's tilted. It's never going to be level. Uh, cause I'm not. So, <laughs> you know, if you're not symptomatic, these and aren't she's things not level-headed either. <laughs> I'm no, not. <laughs> these aren't things that we need to chase or worry about. If you are symptomatic and you have asymmetries that might be related to that, then sure, we could work on them. We could work on minimizing them. But that does not mean that you need to be perfectly symmetrical in order to feel okay. Mm -hmm. And you may not even need to deal with them in order to feel okay because one of the big things that we look at is program management, load mm -hmm. management, mm -hmm. all of these other factors mm -hmm. that could be aggravating something that might not just be because you're uneven. Yeah. But uneven. yeah. And I think that's, we always talk about the weakest link, you know, when load management and fatigue management is off your, whatever your weakest link is, is going to come through. And in running, my weakest link was my foot, you know, um, and in barbell training, oftentimes people have their weakest link is like pelvic floor dysfunction or their grip, uh, losing their grip on the deadlift or their back rounding or their knees sliding forward or their knees caving or whatever, their elbow, um, like their elbow falling in or on the bench press, you know. Um, so when our load management, our program management is off, that's when these things start to creep in. But it's not that we have to to address it the thing it's that we have to address the program um and unless these things are affecting your function outside of training they really don't need to be addressed 
I agree. And especially when, you know, obviously there's, there are asymmetries, but then what if we have a symmetrical bilateral range of motion limitation? It's actually Again, almost better sometimes to be bilateral. Have like yeah, I'd rather have I'd it rather, on both sides. Yeah, because then it <laughs> then it's not a limitation. Then it's just your normal, you know. Yeah, and that and that is that is a really good point because we also are looking at someone's normal, not just the perfect in terms of what the textbook says mm-hmm. the range of motion mm-hmm. to be for a certain joint. Right. You know, when we see an asymmetry, we're looking mm-hmm. at the your other side. Um, but we might even we might not need to address a bilateral range of motion air quotes limitation um (laughs) if it's not inhibiting anything you do and Mm -hmm. you're not having symptoms and like you know it might not matter and that's oftentimes like when we find things or even when we find things on images that maybe aren't related Mm. to symptoms again it might not matter and if you are having symptoms we might be able to address them without changing the thing that might seem to be the obvious visual thing um we we and especially if it's how you've always been moving around and all of a sudden you're having symptoms, like right. why, you know? No, yeah, it's <laughs> definitely not that, you know, it's like yeah. what changed in your life or in your training or whatnot. So, um, and to your point though, I just want to add, you know, we are not discrediting the people who have had traumatic injuries like fractures or, you know, surgeries to their ankle or, massive injuries that really have led to a very significant range of motion limitation in their ankle those we should really address Mm -hmm. Um, and those will probably affect squat depth or could have the potential depending on how much range you have Um, so again this is not the episode we're not talking about you if you've had an ORIF in your ankle, if you've had like multiple ankle sprain, you know, we're not talking about you. We're talking about the person who's just been told that they should work on their ankle range because they're, they have tight ankles and that's why they can't squat to depth. Again, we have worked, I just counted how many clients you've had over the, the last, since you've worked here at, in two, since you started in 2019. You've had almost close to 200 clients come through PRS directly with you. And how many of them have not been able to squat to depth? There's one that I think that, you know, we've, that you also know. Oh, you'll have to tell me who. You've, last time you asked me this question, you thought of the answer for me. Oh, I'm trying to think now. Oh, I have no idea at this moment. A client of both of ours. Oh, but it wasn't his ankles, right? It was not ankles. It was his hips. Yep. Yep. But so. nobody else has not been, you know. Yeah. So and that one. Wasn't even an all and that was thing. both of our clients. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that. And I, gosh, I've been doing this since 2014. So, like, obviously more than 200 clients. Um, so. Yeah. And that's just, I couldn't online. Think of that's anything. just online, oh, you know, yeah. like obviously I've like worked in the clinic. I've had people come to, to, you know, see me in person. Um, and, and literally not one person has been except for that one. And I that can't think of an anybody. ankle thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've had, yeah, I couldn't, I forget when you asked, you asked me this question. It was, we had a, we had a question about squat ago. depth and I was like, I don't think there's anybody. And yeah. then you brought that up. Yeah. But. So anyway, Um, yeah, uh, fix your knowledge about the squat, improve your body awareness and make sure you're strong enough for what you're lifting. Cause a lot of times people, like, even if you're strong, a lot of people lift weight that's too heavy that they can't squat to depth because it's too heavy. Not be, you know, and so then, oh my gosh, we could go into, we should do a whole episode on all the problems of not training to depth and then. (laughs) Because they're using loads that are too heavy. Don't get me started. That's a whole other thing. Um, But if you are experiencing an ankle range of motion deficit, even if you have, like, because of a massive injury, like, the squat will help you improve your range of motion if you are doing it correctly. So, um, and with appropriate load. So, and also it's mind over matter. You really have to use your brain to change your movement patterns and make sure you are using your range of motion 
when you are trying to improve your range of motion. So like I said, I was using the stairs. I was, I was thinking about it. I was making conscious effort to put my foot flat. I took my shoes off so that I could focus on keeping my heel down when I was squatting. Um, in the clinic, I was hanging out in squats uh, when I was, when I'm working with like, not clinic, it's my garage. When I'm with my clients in the garage, I hang out in my squat, um, to really like load that, that area and change the tissue because just doing a stupid little ankle mobility exercise or some joint mobs or using a band and pulling at the ankle is not going to affect your, that is 30, that is like two minutes out of your day when you're using that ankle 90% of your day, you know? So you've got to change, you've got to change your ankle mobility through, and this is like posture education. Like someone comes to, it's the same thing with everything else. Someone comes to us for back pain. Well, if you're not focusing on like your position when you're, you know, if you're going to, you have to consciously like change your position throughout the day so that your back's not hurting. You have to be consciously aware of like when you're experiencing your symptoms throughout your day so that it doesn't worsen your symptoms, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're in physical therapy two hours a week, that's not the majority of your time. That's not what's going to fix. Yeah. I've said that to, you know, I remember like, I always just say it years ago when I was working with people in person who come in and they like wanted to see you know, changing their body or weight loss. And I'm like, you see me for three hours out mm-hmm. of the week. I don't know mm-hmm. what you're doing when you leave here, but it's yeah. probably not, not, <laughs> not helping Three you. hours can not undo eating, everything you know? else. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't yeah. look at me. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> so it's not, not the problem. It is not that little ankle exercise <laughs> that's going to help you. It's everything else. Every action you take, every step that you take, it's going. that's what's going to make the difference. Um, so in any event... Do you want to do the honors of closing this episode, Alyssa, <laughs> since you're the host today? <laughs> Thank you, Rory, for um, agreeing to, <laughs> to this interview <laughs> and talking to us about your, your experience with your ankle and your sort of ups and downs through all different kinds of activity, whether it be mm-hmm. running or, well, biking is something you seem to be fine with, but also... Oh, biking is affected and... by my, my back and my hip. Forget it. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't bike anymore. <laughs> That's another episode. <laughs> um, but really, you know, you, the things that we discussed and the things that you pointed out are that, you know, we don't have to focus in on fixing this one body part. And I say fixing, I think just imagine air quotes. Her air quotes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, resolving specifically a, a mobility limitation before getting under the bar and actually you can get under the bar to work on those things. And, and, you know, in almost every case, um, but you know, it just really kind of brings to light how I think it's simple. It is when you step back and look at, okay, I can just do this thing and use my brain and think about my body rather than, Oh my goodness, I need 20 different exercises. Um, but yeah, I really, I think that your approach is obviously very, very direct and is how we, we yeah. like to handle things here. So thank you for talking to all of my us pleasure. and hopefully reducing some anxiety. If there's anybody out there who's worried about their ankle or worried about their squat. And if you are, and if somebody's told you that you have, you know, limited ankle mobility, or if you're just struggling to get to to depth, uh, you know, join us in our secret society of barbell mastery, post some videos. We do free form checks in there and we will be happy to give you advice and feedback and help you with whatever it is with your squat or any other lift that you Mm -hmm. need help with. So thank you. All right, guys, we will see you next time.